Today's COVID update is brought to you by Fultech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service. And we are back and we're jumping right into our first conversation. If you're joining us now, we are going to be getting an update all about the work of the United States Embassy here in Belize. And here to discuss that with us is uh, the Chargé d'Affaires from uh, the U.S. Embassy. And that is uh, Mr. Keith Gilgues. Good morning, Keith. Good morning, Gavin. Good morning, Marlene. Great, great to be back, if not in person, at least remotely. Yeah, well, it's great to have you. It's great to have you here um, with us, too. And so um, we're going to be getting an update on um, some of the work that the embassy is doing. Um, a few months ago, you were in our studio, and one of the projects that you had um, discussed was the Beyond the Horizon project, which, is, um, which was going on. So um, perhaps um, you can refresh some of our viewers' and memories and remind them what the Beyond the Horizon project is and what it's all about. Were it not for COVID and, and all the restrictions on travel and everything else, we would have you know a few hundred uh, um, U.S. military folks here, you know, doing an exercise where they're practicing their ability to construct buildings, uh, to perform surgeries, to provide this whole variety of medical care. And, and I did a whole big uh, uh, you know sort of media tour back in January to explain all of this. And of course, unfortunately. Uh, that whole event had to be canceled. So now we're, uh, we're, we still have some commitments we make. You know, there are a couple communities that in order to get the new school in, um, had to demolish the old one. And now that the whole Beyond the Horizon um, exercise had to be canceled or perhaps postponed for another year, but, but at this point, um, uh, we don't know. We said, listen, we've still made a commitment to those communities. So we are in the process of contracting out uh, so that those schools can still be built. So, you know, that's a commitment we made and we're gonna, we're gonna live up to it. In addition, we are exploring options to still bring in folks from Southcom uh, to, uh, uh, to do those, those, those um, surgery initiatives, to, to bring in folks to do medical care. So we're looking to do that in August. Of course, all of this depends on, on what the mobility um, guidance is at the time. But certainly, that's a commitment that we made to the communities, and, and we want to fulfill that commitment. We just have to do it in a different way. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, definitely, COVID has changed pretty much all the plans for 2020 that everyone had. Um, and so we're, we're happy to hear that at least some of the commitments will be able uh, to be followed through. But in the meantime, there are things that are happening. And in fact, just recently, I think it was on Friday, um, you facilitated the donation of two uh, new ambulances uh, to the Western region. Tell us a bit about that. Sure, sure. Now, Friday was a great day for a number of reasons. One of them was that that was the day that I was off quarantine, no. so that I was able to go and, uh, and, and, and visit that site. Listen, there's an, uh, an organization called Virginia Emergency Services, yeah. and they donated two new ambulances um, to the fire department here in Belize. And those ambulances are going to be located, I believe, in Santa Elena and San Ignacio. And what's different about them is that the fire department is going through the process of training their folks to be EMTs. Uh, so that's fantastic. So when an ambulance arrives, they've got an initial care because that, that time between an incident happening and arriving at the hospital is part of what they call that golden hour that's right. in which you need to, to, to get to care. So having those ambulances here will improve the medical care that people particularly in urgent or acute situations are able to receive. And we're just grateful that, again, we had the support of Southcom. Uh, and I believe the C-17 was flown out of, out of, out of Charlotte, maybe Charleston. I, I can't recall exactly where it's based. But it was able to load those, those ambulances on and fly them in under something we call the Denton Act, which, which enables them to, uh, to be able to use those resources to bring in those materials. And so I was just so pleased that I could be there to see the ambulances actually roll off the, uh, roll off the plane. Yeah. I would note. Uh, you know, I saw a couple of comments, a couple of people have mentioned, hey, where are the masks? If you look in my hand, I've got my mask with me. For the photos, we just, we just took off our masks so you could actually see who we are. But we also tried to make sure that in all the pictures, we were appropriately distanced and everybody was wearing masks. And the crew coming in, we also kept a distance from. Yeah. But they all receive constant COVID checks to ensure that they are flight ready. Um, and that's one of the things that, that the military does, because obviously you don't want folks flying on a plane. Uh, if they have COVID. 
So speaking of which, I'm glad you, you, you used that particular phrase because we are very uh, curious about the travel experience during the time of COVID. Oh, yeah. Since you had to leave Belize um, to seek medical treatment and you returned um, on a repatriation flight, tell us about what traveling is like um, under the current circumstances. Yeah, sure. You know, it was uh, I, I was appreciative to have the opportunity to be able to go back. I you know had a medical issue that I, I I was grateful to the doctors here, but on their recommendation, they said you should go see some specialists in the state. So so I, I chose to do that, and I was grateful to have the opportunity. So again, thanks to the the Belizean government and United Airlines for putting on those repatriation repatriation flights, and they are ongoing. And there's another one this Friday. So so leaving, it's an odd experience to wander through an airport. Uh, whether it's the Belize airport or whether it's uh, uh, Houston, and they're so empty. So that was certainly my experience. Um, some travel may be increasing, but there weren't as many people on the flight. Uh, there was greater capacity. Everybody was wearing a mask. Yeah. There are fewer services that the, the flight attendants are providing because they're trying to decrease the interaction. Even boarding the plane, they started saying, hey, listen, um, we're going to board from the back of the plane first so that there's a limit in the number of people that you have to walk by to get on the plane. Mm. Uh, certainly on my way back uh, from Washington to Houston, there were not very many people on that flight. And then for the flight from, uh, from Houston here, I think there were eight or nine people total. So I, did, I took a selfie yeah. uh, from where I was sitting just to what looked like an empty plane behind us. But mm. again, grateful to have the opportunity. The, the government of Belize did a terrific job. When we landed, they were screening everybody, went through process. You know, I, I had a slightly different process, again, for which I'm most grateful, where I was able to go and, and do my quarantine here on the compound in my residence, yeah. um, which we abided by rigorously. What about new measures within the airports in the United States? Um, again, when you see everybody there, um, they have masks with them. Uh, if they're completely by themselves in an area, you know, they may not have their mask on, but when people are moving around, everyone that I saw had a, had a mask on. Certainly, I ended up spending uh, four weeks in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and again, the protocols there were pretty rigorous. Uh, it was, I, I'll have to admit, it was spooky, you know, being out on the street, you know, you go for a walk to get some exercise, and a city that's normally bustling uh, was empty. Um, you, you didn't see that many people, you know, restaurants were closed when I first got there. They started to reopen as I was leaving, but there is, you know, distance, you know, the same tape that you see, you know, on the, on the, on the sidewalk here uh, at all the stores, you know, the Safeway where I do a little grocery shopping, you know, required a mask. Every place required a mask for you to go inside um, and they limited the number of people that were there and all the aisles, you know, had one lane each, everything being done to try and try and limit the potential spread. And, mm -hmm. and you know, those are, those are things the government can do and businesses can do, but people have to engage with it as well yeah. and be as responsible as they can. Did there, um, was there a significant increase in the amount of time you had to spend at the airport with health checks or social distancing protocols? Uh, no, um, because the airports were so empty, in fact, you automatically had a degree of social distancing just because there weren't that many people there. You know, you weren't crowded around a gate. You could sit and just automatically without seats being marked off as don't sit here or here, people just automatically spaced out. Uh, that's, a, that's a funny term. I didn't mean they spaced out, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, there was distance between them. And, uh, um, and so, you know, people are taking this responsibility on. And, and the tricky part, as I see it for uh, for most folks, and that includes my family, where my sister is looking after my my 86 year old or 83 year old father. You know, it was easy during a lockdown. It is harder as things start to open to be sure that you're not putting folks at risk. And I see the real challenge um, being when uh, folks start traveling more. If somebody says, "Hey, listen, you know, I'd rather ride the elevator alone. What if the other person doesn't want to wait?" And trying to manage those risks and say, "Hey, listen, if we are going to be close together." you've got to wear a mask. And if you're outside in all those circumstances, and I think the government here has, has done a great job putting out that message. Yeah. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking that, um, you know, uh, we've been also see, we've been seeing a lot of um, images, of course, recently about things that are happening in the United States. And of course, we know that people 
um, have started to, to go out more, um, things are slowly opening up. But of course, one of the biggest issues that has um, been made the news over the past few weeks is uh, the, the ongoing protest situations that are going on in many U.S. cities. So I'm wondering if, um, while you were there, um, if you, did you have any first-hand observation of that, or was that um, after you left? Um, was was any of that going on in uh, where you were? Yeah. It, well, listen, I was I was right in downtown Washington D.C. So. So, you know, I was in Washington when the horrific killing of George Floyd took place in Minneapolis. You know, I was there. We could see protests walking by from the window of the little Airbnb that we were staying in. And yes, I went down to, uh, to Lafayette Square to see. And, you know, when I was there, I also saw, you know, it was peaceful protesters, um, most of them wearing masks, and most of them had a degree of distance. Was it ideal? No, um, but you know there there are also competing competing priorities there, and and people did feel that it was appropriate and right for them to go out and express their views as a result of not just that incident, yeah. but the buildup of these incidents. You know, starting 400 years ago with our tragic history of slavery, and and I think we're at a moment now that is different. I I, I think we've seen these sorts of killings happen so often and there's horror and outrage and then we move on and my sense is is this time it's different mm -hmm. and that there is a greater push to see systemic change that i do believe needs to happen mm -hmm. and we're looking you know at the embassy here how can we ensure that our internal processes are free of bias how can we assess everything that we're doing from microaggressions um, to systemic and unconscious or conscious bias in our system to make sure that, that, that we're, we're doing everything we can to promote a culture of diversity and inclusion. And then also, how can we express that externally? And, and we're looking to do some events uh, in the very near future on that end. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's a challenge in the US. I saw the protests, I went down, um, saw them whether it was from my window or, or in person. And the hope is that what comes out is lasting change, is that this really is a turning point in which everybody's saying this issue is not just an issue for people of color or for people who are discriminated against or people who fear their interaction with the police. This is an issue we all need to take on and we can all do better. Yeah, Keith, it's, 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 it's interesting. Um, I think when you hear the conversations around what's happening with the protests, um, because you're right. I think it, it's not just about the police. I think it's about um, uh, the, the systemic racism that does exist. And sometimes um, even people who may be unaware uh, of the prejudice they may be displaying. You know, what is it like for you, um, one, as a citizen, but you're also a public servant, to speak about this issue? Because, you know, when you speak about uh, the police, it is an extension of, of uh, government services. Well. You know, first of all, we have to be speaking about these issues. We've got to, to speak up. We've got to have conversations. And they're going to be tough conversations. Mm -hmm. There are going to be instances where somebody undoubtedly will come to me and say, hey, Keith, you know, you mishandled that a little bit. I'm not sure if you appreciated what that language you used meant. And it's hard not to get defensive. And it's hard not to say, well, that's not what I meant and everything else. It's like, but you've got to stop and listen mm -hmm. and say, hang on, let me make sure I'm hearing what you're saying and realize that, that I can do better, but everybody needs to do that. And so these are tough conversations, but they're ones that we, we must have. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the, the debate between, you know, is it a difference between whether, um, you know, everybody is equal under the law or we need to have law and order? Well, I view them as the same thing. Yeah. And that means holding law enforcement to the same standard that we would anybody else. And so being pro-law enforcement is also being Pro equality under the law. And so, you know, you can look at the data and see yeah. that there is disproportionate impact of the activities of some folks in law enforcement on communities of color. Mm -hmm. That needs to be balanced. And, and a person of color needs to be able to say, I am as likely to be protected by the police as somebody else. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think to myself, if and I have been pulled over by the police, not for years, but for speeding a couple times when I was younger and in my 20s and a, and a little <laughs> reckless with my driving uh, and got pulled over. 
And my thought at the time was, I wonder if I can talk my way out of this ticket. Mm -hmm. That is not the same thought that an awful lot of people of color have when they're pulled over. Okay. But it should be. And that's how we get to the point that, that there is equality within what is appropriate. We do want to have law and order in our country. Peaceful protests are absolutely part of law and order. So, so that's sort of where I come at it. I hope that makes sense. And, it, yeah. and it's been going on for weeks, though. Where, what, where do you see the end? What, what do you see being the end of this um, process? Because currently, the, the main um, point of advocacy is talking about defunding the police. And the terminology itself oftentimes leads people to believe that it means taking away the funding. Um, and there are different explanations that people use. But do you think that's a, a practical goal or one that may be considered? I, I think when you're looking at systems that have some bias sort of baked into to what they are, it takes a while. It takes training. Um, but it also takes a focus to say, does it make sense in every instance that the first responder to an issue is the police? Are there other resources, if properly funded, that are better trained to respond to that individual issue? If somebody's having a, a mental health crisis of some kind, it may be that a social worker is the first person who should respond with the right training and not necessarily someone with a gun. Um, and so it's finding that right balance. So I, I you know, I, 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 I don't support one particular, you know, political movement or another, but when I hear those words, it's also think about the policy behind them and say, okay, it's a great slogan, but what are we looking at doing? And I think that's ensuring that we're providing the appropriate services in each community in uh, an equitable way. And, and you know, yes, we will need police. We're not gonna defund police departments. They're an essential part of, 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 of any community, but they can be run better and there can be better training in place, uh, but we also need to then provide other, other social services. And that's where the public policy challenge is because everybody's competing for budgetary dollars. You know, um, it's interesting to hear you speak like this, and I'm saying that because of, um, you know, somebody in your position and you're, give, and you're giving um, what um, to me is, it seems to be a very tempered sort of uh, balanced view when, um, you know, President Trump, on the other hand, seems to, um, some t to take a more hostile approach um, to what um, has been developing over the past few weeks. And um, it's, 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 it's interesting that you, know, you representing the US government here in Belize has, has that kind of more of a view because one would think that knowing um, what we know about the president uh, and um, you know, the various um, uh, bodies or branches of government that are under him are generally, um, have also come out you know, in support of him uh, and, uh, and his um, remarks, which um, have a time, which some people view as incendiary, some view as not um, necessarily being, um, let's say, um, you know, he's not receptive enough to the to the message and change. So, so um, it is interesting to hear your perspective. Well, thank you for saying that I'm balanced and tempered. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Um, I also want to be clear. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that anything that I'm saying mm -hmm. in any way contradicts uh, the policies of this administration. Now, we also have to be careful. We are in a political season. Mm -hmm. uh, you're in a political season here in Belize, too. Um, mm -hmm. And we have to be careful that there is a difference between what the policies are that are being put out and what may be said uh, during a, a political, you know, political rally. And, and that the, the key is to try and differentiate between what is policy and, and, and what is politics uh, during a campaign. So I don't believe anything that I've said contradicts that. I also can only speak from where I come from. Yeah. And, and you know, I've been entrusted with this role. Um, I'm not an automaton. Mm -hmm. I, I do have thoughts and feelings and I, I do consider these issues deeply. Yeah. Um, I represent the administration 100%. That is my job here. But I believe everything that I've said and done is consistent with the policies um, uh, as enforced by this administration. So, you know, keeping in that theme, of course, we know that there was an attempt to hold a protest um, in Belmopan in front of the U.S. Embassy. Um, the, um, the permit was not granted. 
Um, but it is an, an interesting, uh, I think, offspring of what we've seen from the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, where globally people are responding. Um, what were your thoughts on, on having a protest in Belize? Was it something that uh, you were concerned about, or what was your re reception to that? My only concern was that if protesters did peacefully come and, and present their views in front of the embassy, that they would be dispersed. You know, that, that was certainly not the image. My other fear was that I'm still on quarantine. I can't go and engage with them. I can't go and listen to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, now, I understand, listen, the police said at this point, this is against the statutory instrument that protest, you know, cannot go forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. But again, my take from that is I want to engage with people that want to have this conversation. Yeah. And we're immediately looking at ways, and we're going to do a Facebook Live, as I mentioned sort of a, at the top of my remark. We're going to do a Facebook Live uh, next week. Um, I can't remember the exact date. Okay. But we're going to bring some folks in, uh, socially distanced, but to have this conversation. And listen, we're bringing in a couple people that are likely to be largely critical of some U.S. policies. But unless we have that conversation, unless we say, listen, I'm here and I'm listening. So, you know, folks that are, it is a right to peacefully protest at the appropriate moment, yeah. you know, when it's not up against the statutory instrument. And I'm happy to engage with those folks and hear their voices. Yeah. So, you know, as, as we go forward, that's again, part of the conversation. The other point that I wanna make quickly is the experience that we're having in the US can have some application and, and people in other countries can say, hey, either I'm standing in solidarity and protesting in solidarity with what's happening in the United States, or hey, I'm seeing some of this in my own country. Right. Now, what, what we have to be careful about is what's happening in the US is not directly applicable to Belize. And we've got to be careful that this, this isn't necessarily about you know, that movement in the States and what's happening here. So, so what we're hoping to do with the, with the Facebook Live event is have a couple um, uh, Afro-Belizeans who you know, grew up here, are Belizean, but have traveled to the States to speak about the different experiences they had yeah. as people of color you know, in Belize and in the United States. And they are different scenarios. There can be some similarities and there are things we can learn from each other, but it's not directly applicable. Mm. So you will be having that next week. That'll be an open conversation for everyone to participate in or to at yeah, least it's gonna see. Be, it's yeah. gonna be Facebook Live, we're doing it in, in cooperation with the um, government of Belize press office. I believe they're giving the cameras. We're gonna yeah. set up in, uh, in the multi-purpose room at the embassy, yeah. which is the biggest room we have so that we can have folks at the table, but we're all uh, distanced appropriately um, to have this conversation. And we invite everybody to it. So I, I, I want to shift back to, to COVID for a minute because we, we can't not talk about the elephant in the room. And that is just the growing number of cases in the United States and the difference in how uh, the situation, the pandemic is being handled there. Um, you know, Keith, let, let me just hear from you what your thoughts are on, on the U.S.'s management of the pandemic. You're at uh, over 100,000 lives lost. 120,000, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And over, I think it's over 2 million cases at this point. So, yeah. Um, listen, let me first start by commending, you know, the government of Belize for everything it's done. Yeah. Um, one of the benefits of being uh, a smaller country in terms of population is that the government is able to put things in place and that pertains to the entire government so there is a degree of control here yeah. uh, that is different in the united states where you've got municipal governments that own certain issues you've got state governments you've got the federal government so yeah. what you're seeing is what is typical of the u.s that each state is its own we say they're they're laboratories of democracy people try policies in one place if it works it will start spreading to other states you know and so you have these ideas communities will respond in their own way and again, it's up to communities to do their best to respond appropriately. I think what we saw was communities that went on lockdown and it prevented the spread. And so they didn't necessarily see the impact in person firsthand. Um, communities like New York clearly did. Uh, I, I, I didn't lose any friends in New York. I did lose friends in, in Washington, D.C. to COVID. And so that really, really brings it home. Um, for some of these communities, they say, listen, this public policy balance between public health and the economy is really tough. And how do you put in place policies that don't cause as much suffering from 
the inability to buy food, from the inability of distribution channels to continue with the threat from COVID. And, and so we're seeing in communities that said, hey, listen, we're going to try and, and open up to a degree. You're seeing some cases spike. They're going to have to pull back. I believe they will pull back and say, hang on, we need to put uh, increased procedures in place to try and, again, bend that curve back down. But these are really tough decisions for public policymakers to try and figure out how to manage this because COVID's going to get around. You know, it's going to spread to a degree. How do you ensure that the spread doesn't cause a giant spike in, in certain communities that overwhelms health care? Do you think the matter became too political? I mean, in, in other countries, we see when there's an, uh, a, a shared message, a common message um, that is adapted by all. In Belize, we had our bipartisan approach in, in, in being able to attempt um, in, in our efforts to contain that first wave. Um, in, in the United States, even the use of masks has become a, a political issue. I, I think, you know, this is a political time. There's an election coming up very soon, and I, and I like to steer as clear as I can I know. From, from, from politics. Yeah. But, but yeah, it, 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 it is a challenge between, you know, a political message and a public health message, yeah. and trying to find that right balance is tough. Yeah. You know, listen, again, it is incumbent upon people to say, you know, I wear a mask, um, because I'm also helping to prevent the potential spread to other people. And so to me, that's a bit of a, of a shared commitment. Um, we can put, you know, communities, states, the government can put policies in place. Um, but again, I think their best place to make those decisions, uh, you know, up there. And, and, and I want to be a little bit careful about, about wading into that public policy arena. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it is a absolutely critical to us when we um, pay attention to what's happening in the United States and we hear of um, new areas that are having an increased number of cases because we are uh, in the midst of our debate in being able to open the airport and allow for travelers to come in and as you're very well aware the majority of those travelers usually come from the United States um, so, you know, what are your thoughts on, on the impact of, of COVID on the tourism sector um, and, and whether you think Americans will even have uh, the, the finances to be able to travel when and if we, when we open the airport. Mm -hmm. well, well, certainly what I can speak is, uh, to is that we have had requests, you know, to our Facebook page recently from, from people in the U.S. saying, hey, when is Belize going to open? You know, we want to visit. We want to come back. And mm -hmm. maybe in part that's due to the fact that there is such a low rate. I believe there are three active cases, all asymptomatic yeah. here in Belize at this point, and, and they'll be nearing the end of their, their two week period and they might test negative soon. So, so that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, so, but for the most part, I think Americans who still want to travel just want to come to Belize because it's an amazing place uh, to visit and that hasn't changed. Yeah. But how you manage opening up, how you say, listen, we're going to start having flights coming in, um, that that as soon as you do that you are increasing the risk but ultimately the public policy experts you know the, the the leaders have to try and make a decision you can't eliminate risk you've got to find a way to manage it as best you as best you can and uh, and figuring out how to open up as safely as possible is going to be tricky and inevitably you will be increasing the risk but there is a risk to staying closed. There's a risk to saying, listen, tourism is so important to the economy here. It can't stay closed forever. Yeah. And the government still, you know, continue to be able to provide the services that it needs to provide. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, in the end of the day, I'm grateful that I'm not the one making these decisions. If there's any public policy guidance or advice we can offer, I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's going to be on, on Belize's leaders to figure out how they balance those risks uh, when it comes to, to reopening. And uh, let's talk about your consular services that are available. So at this point, uh, our consular close? section is still, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. At this point, our, our consular uh, section is still closed. We are not, we are not operating at, uh, at full capacity by any stretch yet. You know, the, the, the government, the State Department is going through a, a sort of a four-phase program, you know, phase zero closed you know, maximum telework only allow that sort of thing. Phase one, which is what we're in at the embassy right now, which allows around zero to 40% uh, 
um, occupancy at the embassy, folks still working from home or working you know, remotely from somewhere uh, or, or up in the United States, but we're limiting the number of people at the embassy. When we get to phase two, and, and, and based on conditions in Belize, we will move to phase two at some point, then we're able to offer services to American citizens uh, for specific issues like notarials, uh, renewing passports, those sorts of things. At this point, there is um, uh, no date at which we will resume uh, visa services. And I think that's the, the key one Definitely, that you're asking about. Yeah. Because yeah. that's out of our control at this point. The Bureau of Consular Affairs back in Washington has put a global halt on consular services, visa services. So it's not up to my embassy. It's not up to me to decide when we can restart those. Yeah. Once the Bureau of Consular Affairs says, okay, we are now passing back to each mission the right to decide whether or not uh, it will reopen. At that point, then we say, okay, we're already, we've removed chairs from the consular waiting room. We will change the, uh, uh, the way that people enter and leave so that they are distanced from each other. We'll um, change how appointments are scheduled so that there's time in between each appointment. Yeah. So again, our intent with that is to protect the visa applicants who are coming in yeah. um, from the possibility of transmission with each other. You know, for our workers, other than our, our security personnel, uh, you know, they're behind glass. Mm -hmm. so, so they're largely protected from within the business. But listen, we're looking to get up and running as soon as we can do so uh, responsibly. What you, what's your advice to uh, people who do need to get access to, uh, if it's a student visa, um, just what type of communication they should be sending out saying, uh, talking about the situation because they can't get any access to even getting, getting the process started? Yeah, at, at, at this point, um, uh, I'm not sure if people can go online and fill out the forms yet. What we can't provide is, is, is an interview. Mm -hmm. So they can start that process um, and, and get that going. And then once we, we restart interviews, um, then they'll be able to schedule appointments. I believe, I, 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 can, I can double check on that, but I, I think the websites are still up and running. Mm -hmm. um, in emergency circumstances, there is the possibility to issue a visa, but it's not going to be for, for routine matters. And, and again, and, and this is a tough thing to say, but what somebody might consider an emergency on their part may not be something that we say is an emergency. Um, and, and at this point, because travel is so limited, um, it doesn't feel as tough because we're still seeing what schools will do in the fall. We have some time uh, um, in place. And listen, once we're up and running, we will push to get through as many, uh, if there's a backlog, as many visa cases as we can responsibly. Okay. All right. And Keith, uh, anything else that you'd like to share with us this morning? I, listen, I'm just grateful to be back in Belize. Again, thanks to everybody that made it possible for me to come back here. Uh, look forward to, to continuing our work. If remotely, maybe sometime soon, I'll be able to come and see you at the studio. <laughs> but really, really grateful for the, the partnership we have. And, and I'm very thankful. People sent me an awful lot of warm wishes during my medevac in the States. And, and I'm grateful for all of those, but I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be back. Well, you're always welcome here. We have enough space to social distance. Just means you have to wake up earlier, that's all. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for having this conversation with us this morning. Great. Thanks, Marlene. Thanks, Gavin. Appreciate All it. Right. Thank you. All right. And there you have it. That was the, the Chargé de Affairs of the U.S. Embassy to Belize, Keith Gilgis, talking a bit about what's happening in the United States. Um, and for us here at home, especially understanding what's happening uh, with visa services. We know people have been asking about that. Um, and so at least for now, it seems like it's just more of a weight game for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we got to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, we are going to be talking to Pathlight International about uh, their e-conference summer training that's coming up. So please stay tuned. This COVID update was brought to you by Foltech Systems, your technology center, where you'll come for the price, but stay for the service.